<laughs> I feel like that would be an understatement. <laughs> could I could I say something real short here before we start? I was talking to Bill this morning. We we're talking about I was going to do this, so he's gone out there and he's digging um, holes in the garden for the cabbage plants, so he doesn't uh, <laughs> slam doors and things. But he told me a very interesting <laughs> story about you, Mr. Banks. Uh, uh oh. When <laughs> when either I have forgotten this, it wasn't memorable to me, but Bill went on and on with great passion about this, that uh, when we were building, we were sort of these two crazy hippies moved to the country living in the little cottage in the forest, you know, waterfall and all of that, and squirrels running up and down the trees. Um, and suddenly, you know, when we met your dad and we sort of changed our whole life, okay, let's go back to, you know, normal, whatever that is. And we were building... Um, um, an English tutor house for some strange reason on the waterfront and we had both gone to work and back to normal. Um, and Bill said something really interesting. He said in those days, like you, you had a hammer and he said he probably put 10,000 nails. This was a, a, you know, I saw a picture of this house in a magazine and they were selling plans and I said, showed it to Bill, romantic tutor cottage. And I said, could you build this? And he said, oh sure you know so i send away for the plans and it's like oh my god even experienced carpenters around here you know it's like what what a challenge so he said no nail guns in those days he did it all with a hammer you know like this but he said often quite often and i guess because i wasn't there banging nails i don't remember this you would uh you were 1978 how how old were you dave uh i was a teenager yeah, Bill says you were a yeah. teenager. You'd get off the school bus by our house, and you'd come over and bang nails with them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, yeah, and, I remember and that. And help them out for for no pay, no reason. Just you just yeah, wanted I, to do. It. What a beautiful yeah. story, and so typical of those times. I learned know? quite a bit from Bill, actually. Yeah. <laughs> cuss words? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I don't remember any cuss words. <laughs> <laughs> oh goody. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to throw that in there. I, I just heard that this morning for the first time. It was so beautiful. That's cool, Linda. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's awesome. Well, I think we can get started. We're pretty much, we're pretty much there, right? Eh? Yeah, and I, I, I'm going to start with a very short intro just because I want to get, you know, get to, 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 the main, to the main event, so to speak. But um, real quick, Michael Fall, who's going to be uh, moderating this, he reached out to me and said, hey... I, I may have some cool news. I've been speaking to two wonderful people. Um, one is Linda Curing, who's written two incredible books, by the way, uh, and uh, Dave Banks, who is Sid Banks' son. And uh, they may have some stuff to, to talk about that many of us may, may or may not know, most likely not. And I was floored. And I said, when and what, how can we do this? And I am so looking forward to it, to this, and I can't thank you guys all enough for being so interested uh, to hear about what they have to say. Right now, we have so far um, 132 people coming as we're starting, uh, which is more than I've had in any call, and deservingly so. So everyone here, get ready to listen, get ready to have fun. Michael, it's on you this time. Uh, the floor is for you. And a big welcome to Linda and a big welcome to David Banks for, for joining us today. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers, Amir. Uh, no pressure there. Eh? Big shoes. So <laughs> I'd like to kind of start just because I got to say thank you to Amir as well for, for doing this, um, for stepping up. Because the forum, I mean, I just, I can't create, I, I don't have a big enough following in my own little club. So big love to Amir for allowing us to Amir for allowing us and let's make sure everyone is muted real quick. So if you, uh, can you, can you mute everyone? Yes. Amir? Let me mute everybody. As people are drifting in. So big love to Amir for, for facilitating and moderating. And then, and then of course I got to give love to my friend Silas who, uh, without him, I wouldn't have had the experience of the principles that I did without him. I wouldn't have gotten in touch with Linda and without Linda, I would never have met Dave. So Silas. Silas. Yeah, big love to Silas. Um, so uh, we've got David Banks and Linda Quiring here. Let's get to it. Um, David, I, I think the floor, I think this starts with you. And why are you here? Why are you doing this now? 
Well, thank you, Mike. Well, I, first of all, I, I know that there's a lot of people out there who, who don't know me and haven't met me. Some of the old guard will know me for sure. But um, the main, I think the main reason I, I wanted to do this, this talk was firstly because it is the 10th anniversary of my father's passing. So it's, it's this month is, so it's special in that sense. And um, um, I feel like he always wanted me to, um, and other people have told me this as well, that he always wanted me to um, maybe take a, a more significant role than I than I am inclined to be in the past. So, I mean, when he was around, it was obviously I was living in the shadow, and there were big shoes to fill. So I I never said very much of anything. But um, now that he's he's no longer with us, and uh, um, you know things are kind of taken off quite in quite a terrific way in the last 10 years, mostly good. Um, and um, so I, I just thought it was a, uh, an opportune time to, to, you know, answer some questions that maybe have never been answered before that some of that information, I, I, I will be the only one privy to. So I just thought it would be uh, helpful for others to get to know him a little bit better, especially those that never met him or never had the opportunity to to meet him well we certainly appreciate you coming forward dave and, and giving us your time it's it's quite amazing um for those of you that that maybe missed the very beginning of the call this is a pretty historic thing that we're all taking part in right now so i hope we all appreciate it for for what it is as an opportunity mm -hmm. um one of the questions that dave that i think this is actually your question um and it's an amalgamation of a lot of questions that were on the facebook page about um, your father's enlightenment experience, um, any change in your father and, and, and how he may have parented you. So, so we're going to start off with how did your, how did your father's spiritual journey begin and how did it unfold? Okay. Well, I mean, the, um, we've talked about this, Michael, that basically I, I, I've divided his life into kind of five main stages. Uh, and, the first stage was goes way back to the 1960s. I was very, very young then. Uh, and uh, he was, um, you know, what I call in his Scottish phase, where he was, um, he would wear, wearing kilts and, and he had a, a, a Scottish radio show, which he, he hosted. And most of his friends were British or Scottish. And, you know, he was very much into that Scottish theme. But not on any particular spiritual journey, and uh, he was he was just a working man, a family man, and and uh, you know doing a little bit of partying and so on. But uh, uh, basically, I mean, he that was the first phase, and then the second phase, which begins in the very late 1960s and goes into the early 1970s, is what I believe he started searching and. Um, if we had enough time, we could talk about why I think that that happened. But in any event, I think that's a good. Sorry, David. I think it's a good idea for us to talk about why as well. Well, there were a couple of I think significant events. Nobody can say for sure to get into someone's head and say for sure. And he never discussed this with me um, directly, but I suspect it had to do with at least two things that were significant. One was when my mother got. Uh, extremely ill, nearly died um, from a brain hemorrhage, and uh, I think that shook him pretty bad. Uh, and the, and the second thing was, as I mentioned to you, Michael, I, he had a friend, a work friend, who was a um, very serious alcoholic, and uh, he was a very extremely nice person. And I think my dad had a particular soft spot for this gentleman, and. Uh, so you know, we would go over on weekends and 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 visit him, and hopefully he was sober. When he was sober, he was just the most amazing person. But um, I think my dad tried very desperately to save him, and in the end, he wasn't successful. So I think that that was the second reason. I think that shook him quite quite badly as well. And then we get into the second phase, which I mentioned starts late sixties, early seventies, in which. He's, he's doing volunteer work for the local crisis center. He's developing a whole new set of 
uh, of friends in different social circles, which is very much out of keeping with what he his, what his circle was. He passed. Um, he's dropped his radio show and uh, he's going to places like Cold Mountain uh, on Cortez Island, which is a kind of retreat workshop retreat. And uh, and he and my mother both are in depth, you know, a clear searching searching phase, I think. So that's you know, and that uh, and then that leads into uh, the early 1970s and in 1973, in the autumn of 1973 is when he had his um, strong, um, profound, what I call Damascus Road experience or epiphany, which really fundamentally changed his life. Yeah. And that was, uh, and then that, after that, things really started to change his life changed very fundamentally after that. How did it change? Well, <laughs> Oh, he he left his work. He he left his 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 home. We all did. We moved to Salisbury Island, and um, you know Linda can take it from there. But uh, you know it was a very different life that we were living. Fundamentally different. Yeah. Uh, Linda, did you have a comment on that? About I mean, it, Linda was there very early on, shortly after his his experience. So she she. she I think I was very young at the time. She probably has a better take on it. Yeah. Linda, you want to share a little bit around that? And, and maybe even just uh, like two minutes mm -hmm. on what Cold Mountain represented back at that time. Well, Cold Mountain, uh, you could Google it today. Um, Hollyhock, I believe it's called now. They've changed the name. Right. Of it. right. And this is a um, world-class place. I mean, they do workshops on, you know, Buddhist um, people will come and do workshops, uh, Buddhism. Uh, all kinds of things. I think Eckhart Tolle has spoken there, um, but you know, world-class teachers of all kinds of things, which would be, uh, I'm not sure, just a spiritual center, but um, kind of just different thinking, you know, very, uh, in the States, I know at the time that um, uh, Sid was going to Cold Mountain, there was a place um, in the California coast, what was the name of it? Um, very famous place and was that cold mountain was it for like all of Canada and probably and people coming from all over the country even like Americans coming it was just the high-end um, consciousness raising new age kind of place in in the early 70s it was called cold mountain after that's I believe that's Japanese for a cold mountain is in Japan, possibly with monasteries up there and so on, but very forward. Uh, people going there were, um, I would say, not usually <laughs> welders that worked in the pulp mills. Well, uh, I, was, I was just, I was just, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to ask about that. It's that seems that would, a little bit contrary to amazingly unusual. Uh, my husband Bill, he always he was a boat builder and he worked. And things like that and he had gone there around the same time um i didn't go uh, but bill went um and uh we went because we had met at a consciousness raising kind of group in our local um you know i just saw an ad in the newspaper or the circular came around for our local college was having different courses and i had taken a few, few different things um that were it was just starting to happen things about consciousness raising and that's where i met bill because he was at this same type of thing and um that was being led by a local psychologist and um and they were younger psychologists and a sociologist who were very with it and gave groups and talks in vancouver and they were in and out of cold mountain so we got connected with that kind of world and cold mountain was um uh, it you know, it was like for North America, there were two places. I forget the one in California, but uh, uh, Cold Mountain was it. Super and cool. the, other thing, the other thing I'll point out, Michael, is that after that Cold Mountain experience, um, which I don't think he was particularly impressed with, actually, but anyway, but Neither after, that experience, <laughs> no, <laughs> after that experience, he had his first insight after that visit to Cortez Island to the Cold Mountain. It wasn't nearly as 
large and significant as the second, but it was still a, quite a powerful insight that he, he that he had about himself. Linda, I think you have a comment. Of, you, you, there, someone at Cold Mountain commented to him at the time, right? What was that? I'm sorry. That someone commented to my father at the time about his insecurity, right? Yes, that? because yeah, Sid, that's, um, that's the story. Sid, right? Yeah, Sid yeah. told me often like he was, you know, maybe a bit shorter than, uh, you know, maybe five foot eight, not five foot ten or something. Um, that he was in about forty and had major, you know, significant hair loss already, going bald. Um, he had a foreign accent. And there was, you know, always a stigma about these people um, that come over, displaced persons and immigrants and everything. So he's a Scottish immigrant with um, no education. He's got grade nine, which is here, what you've got grade nine, you know, that's nothing. But of course, Dave and I both know that at that time period in Scotland, his grade nine was equivalent to our high school today. Yeah. And after grade nine, people went on to university, like you could go to Cambridge after grade nine in Scotland. But here, uh, he had all these disadvantages and worked as a, you know, a welder in a pulp mill and was very, very self-conscious and very exceedingly insecure about himself yeah. in all different ways. And um, he had gone to Cold Mountain um, with Barb and he was doing his, um, you know, you sit around in circles and you know talk about your problems and so on and which was consciousness raising in those days and um i guess this was his main theme always how insecure he was and finally at the end of this um few days or week whatever um he was walking on the beach with a psychologist who had been leading or who had been attending and um sid was going on about his oh, I'm you know so insecure and i'm this and that and the guy said you know what a bunch of you know bs he said i've never heard anything so ridiculous in my whole life like there's no such thing as insecurity and as sid he told this story over and over and over and and he heard this like there's no such thing as insecurity and that just uh w w was the the few words the sentence that uh, it just hit him like like a ton of bricks because his whole life that you know i guess and he was adopted so his childhood even was insecurity oh you know i'm adopted on something and uh it just it, it just hit him and it it's uh slammed into him like this reality well there there's and he realized it as a, a truth fundamental truth there is no such thing as insecurity i'm making all this up in my head and it sort of blows his mind and as Dave said he has his first kind of major experience goes home um, and for three days he's just sitting there and energy pouring through him and all this knowledge you know Linda uh, sorry th this is this is or, sorry Linda uh, this is we're in the second experience already here correct well it's it's actually it's sort of the, the same no, thing okay, he, hears, he hears these words you know, this sort of blows his mind. He goes home, like, and for three days and nights, he's, he's into this. He goes home, he's sitting in front of the fireplace. Remember, he said that he could hear um, Mary, his mother-in-law, and his wife, Barb, that, that was her mom, in the kitchen arguing or something about her. And he's uh, sitting there in front of the fireplace. And suddenly he, he sees with great clarity where the, what they're doing you know, and that we're, how we're all, you know, doing these things. And it's just like, you know, suddenly he's, what he said is I'm home, I'm home. And it's the white light. And uh, when he talked to me about it and, and I had been sort of a spiritual searcher. So I'm reading about enlightened men all the time and not many women in those days, I'm reading about all of this. And what he said was not coming from books from his experience was just classical. It's like, People would say, well, how do you know he's enlightened? And it's like, well, talk to the guy, look at the guy, spend 10 <laughs> minutes around him, you know, and his description of what happened. And he walks into the kitchen and he sees so clearly and he tries to tell them, what, look, you shouldn't be arguing, you know, here's something. And uh, the white light, the whole thing. And he walks into uh, the kitchen and says, I'm home. I'm home. I found it, you know, the, the secret of life. I'm there, you know, I'm home. David, 
Oh, and they both look at him and like he's a glow. They're they're kind of scared. It's a bit freaky. But yeah, that's, that's right. Let's, let's get, all, yeah. Just to set the scene, like when we had this um, family home on Salisbury Island for quite some time, and uh, it was a beautiful location right on the ocean with this kind of panoramic view. So he's looking out the window towards the ocean and he's sitting in front of the fireplace. Um, and um, it's pretty much as Linda described it. And he just had this, he described it to me like almost like he, he died. It was like a rebirth. He died and he came back in a spiritual sense. Um, and, um, and that the weight of his insecurity and the weight of his, his life was lifted off his shoulders. That's what, and, and then he, he was in this kind of almost euphoric state for several days, maybe three or four days, literally didn't sleep. And, um, and he just was, uh, I think my mother was having a little bit of difficulty understanding what was going on and, and communicating with him actually, because he was in this incredible uh, kind of almost altered state of mind. And uh, he kept, did kept saying, I, I'm home. And he kept saying, it's, it's, life's a myth and it just, it's just, uh, all yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And, but it was, um, I mean, anybody who doubts his enlightenment would, you just have to see it. I don't think you'd have much doubt that something pretty profound happened. Yeah. What made it really obvious? <clears throat> what made it very, what made it clear to you, David, that something had shifted in your father? Well, just the experience that, that we just described, firstly, and then his behavior afterwards. I mean, his, his, he was he was in some some ways quite a different person after that after that event. The the way that you've described your dad as as um, even before as of a very compassionate and kind and generous and caring individual. Um, does that get magnified? Does that change at all, or or? Um, yeah, and by the way, um, I, for those of you who are familiar with Simon and Garfunkel, there's a song called Mrs. Robinson. <laughs> that, that started playing, and he... And he oh, he, wow. I didn't know that. Very, I, nobody knows this, but I remember the music playing um, right after he had his experience. I can't remember if he turned it on or what happened, but somehow the, that song was playing, and he was, he was uh, really profoundly um, just listening carefully to the, to the song. The words are, the lyrics of the song are quite interesting. But um, anyway, um, in terms of his um, behavior and, and his, his conduct and everything afterwards, well, he was just, in some ways, he was quite a different person. And um, in, in other ways, he was still the same, oh, Sid Banks, but he, he obviously was looking through a very different lens and he, he saw the world in a very different way than he. He did before it. that. Go ahead. Oh, I'm not sure though. I think that was just someone coming online to. One okay. quick thing, if uh, I could say in them, uh, and there were a family, as I say, there was uh, Barb, her mom, and um, close by living uh, on Main Island War, and I think they'd sort of dropped out also, were Barb's brother, Dave, and his oh. wife, um, Carol, and they had four children about the same age as Dave and his um, younger sister, Susan. Um, and uh, who else? There was, uh, and, and then Barb had an older brother who I believe was a doctor, a surgeon, a psychiatrist right. at, at the very large hospital in Victoria, BC, like, you know, huge city hospital. And uh, after uh, a short while, their verdict was, especially the older brother doctor type who i don't know was kind of maybe a patriarch of the family decided that um sid had uh lost it and needed psychiatric care and uh so the family discussed this amongst them should they haul sid off to the psych ward oh i hadn't heard that <laughs> yes and i i believe that day um barb's take on it was well you know he's different for sure you know but um He's so much more, he's so much more kind, generous, warm, loving, understanding, um, even tempered, uh, just nice yeah. to be around, wonderful person. So father, uh, husband. So if this is crazy, you know, 
I'm all for it. <laughs> so, yeah, what is and she is behind him 125 percent what linda's describing is true and my my uncle my mother's older brother did think he was a bit had, had gone off off the off the cliff but uh not only that him but all his old co-workers were also thought he had lost the plot and were kind of plotting an intervention they thought they <laughs> really that someone had to they they loved him so much that someone had to do something his I remember yeah. his exact words. He said he'd gone yeah. to the plant, did he call it, or the, he went to, um, was it Harmac he worked at? Yeah. The mill? Yeah, he went to the mill, and uh, he's, you know, telling, trying to tell people something has happened to him and everything. And, um, of course, Sid always had this Scottish brogue, and I laugh and laugh, and like he, he always called us uh, deary, you know, the the ladies and so on um but he said at work they thought he had gone to the fairies um <laughs> in my, uh, i have another scottish friend which means in scotland if you've gone to the fairies you're kind of you've just floated off there and you know uh -huh. some kind of other reality and so time to maybe take you in and uh you know put you in the straight tractor or something <laughs> but um yeah that didn't i guess didn't fly at the mill that he had become enlightened yeah david what's um thinking thinking about the what you witnessed of your father's enlightenment does it change over time from 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 the from well does it change over time his behavior well or, or does 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 what he's ex sure his behavior does 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 it seem like there is addition and subtraction going on from his original experience. Is he, is he taking more? Um, I don't think so. Um, he's, he's, I mean, he was always a very kind person. He was always a, you know, um, a generous person. He always had those personality traits in him. I think everything just got kind of exaggerated even more, you know, amplified after after his experience but he he just became um very um sensitive he was very sensitive to people um pain and suffering in particular i think because i think he he had been through so much himself internally and maybe he, he wasn't even maybe voicing or a lot of the pain that he had he probably had a lot more going on inside him than he was um you know letting on but um, he became particularly sensitive to um, others' pain and suffering yeah, and you, emotional distress. Yeah. You, told me, you told me a little story that involved some groceries. Well, yeah. Well, as I said, my, one, of the, one of the traits about my father that I most admire is, was his kindness and generosity. I, I, I don't know if I've ever met another person that was as kind and generous as him. Um, at least they're, they'd be few in number, but, um, you know, he would often do things anonymously. He was the secret Santa for many years for the local school. Um, you know, Sid was never, was um, a, oh, sorry, then. there was a, there was a single mother I know who lived not too far from us who was struggling and he would, he would drop groceries on her, uh, on her front porch on a regular basis and never nobody knew who did it who was doing it I, I found out sometime later what was going on but um you know he, he was just that he was extremely compassionate person no doubt i like the story that you know the the old shirt off shirt off his back thing you know this was sid a friend of ours really good friend of ours who unfortunately passed away quite young uh, Brian Lurcher was a young lawyer and gave it all up in Vancouver, heard Sid speak in Vancouver once, you know, moved to Salt Spring. And uh, he and Jim Wallace, that was the, he was one of the first students, uh, live, lived in the teepee. And the two of them opened up uh, Salt Spring's first legal office. And I was their legal secretary because I'd had that kind of experience. So we all suddenly put on these other clothes. But just before that happened, um, and I guess, like a lot of us, you know, the, the suits and the nice shoes, everything went, went away and we're all just jeans and it's pretty casual hippie stuff. But Brian has to go somewhere or attend something with his family or 
I'm not sure what it was. And he said he just like really didn't have anything to wear. And he bumped into Sid in town and was telling him, well, I'm going off to this event and so on. Gee, gee I'm, you know, I'm headed over to the thrift store or something. Maybe I can find a jacket. So, of course, Sid Banks, you know, takes off the beautiful jacket he's wearing. And um, he didn't have a lot of clothes. Uh, he wore the same things over and over and over, like his favorite shirt, his favorite jacket. But they were that's just... A Scottish, um, that's a Scottish thing, Melinda. Yeah. That's but they very were just, much a Scottish they, thing. They were so... Yeah. Hit, Everything he wore was just so casual and comfortable and, and yeah. lovely. He takes off the jacket, of course, hands it to Brian. Here, you can wear this. And Brian yeah. is like, wow, like, really? I mean, it's like, I remember Brian telling this story. And I was like, okay, and I'll bring it. He said, no, no, no. It's yours. Don't bring it back. It's yours. You know, so not the shirt off his back exactly, but the wonderful, beautiful jacket. And that, that was that. But the, what I was going to say was, and it's just occurring to me as you're, we're talking about this with Sid there was nothing it's like you know coming in like I want this I want that you know I want a new car I want this or I want this to happen that to happen everything and I'm just realizing this it was going out who can I help can I give you this um would you like to go for lunch uh you know yeah like here's some groceries uh Here's some of my, I'm really busy, but here, you know, he wouldn't say that, but you knew he was busy and demands pretty soon, incredible demands upon his time. It's like, sure. Yeah. I've got an hour to, to chat with you about your problem. It was just everything going out, you know, with love for, to help people. I, 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 I agree with that. And, and, and we frequently had, you know, as he became more and more well known, we frequently had strangers knocking on the door we had this long kind of windy driveway that came down through the woods to the house and people would just find, find it and, and wander down the driveway and um, and occasionally arrive by boat but uh, they would just knock on the door and uh, and I, my both my mother and father never turned a single person away they'd be invited in and given a, a cup of tea and dad <laughs> um, and i mentioned to linda at one time that we had come back from a visit to the city it, um, for a few days, we arrived, and there was a whole bunch of people camped out in the in the front yard. You know, that they, they, they had tents up and that sort of thing. And uh, you know, he didn't bat an eye. It was like, okay, well, um, come on in. He, he just was, you know, he would never ask them to leave or anything like that. It wasn't his nature. Yeah. I'd like to. Uh, I've got one more sort of historical, personal kind of question to ask, and then we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, tell us a little bit about your mom and the role that she played in all of this. Um, well, she's a, she's a kind of an unsung hero, I think, in this whole story and probably hasn't had the recognition that she deserves. And I'm pretty sure Linda would probably agree with that. Um, amazing. She, amazing. <laughs> yeah. She was, um, like she was there from the very beginning and, and she was a extremely stabilizing force in his life, I think. Um, she was an incredibly um, emotionally a level person. She just, I don't have a single memory of her ever getting angry or, or raising her voice at someone, or if it did, it didn't happen around me. I never saw that ever. And uh, incredibly gracious. I mean, Linda, I think you were quite close to her. Yes, and probably spent hundreds, hundreds of hours with this woman. She's very quiet, very quiet, mm -hmm. not shy and not introverted, quiet, um, and strong, one of the strongest women. I, um, and I don't know why I say this, I'm trying to think of anything in particular, I can't, but just, just strong, level-headed, like an anchor for Sid. And I'm not sure how he, he could have done what he did without Barb there, just an anchor for the home, the family, the people that came. Um, and she was, um, we were talking just recently and I realized, well, because it's like people, oh, well, I was the kind of the, the first official student who sat there with Sid and actually asking questions and, you know, all of that type of thing. But really, the first student was, would have been for sure Barb, because by the time I met them, which was just a few short months after this experience, Barb was all, she was full of this uh, energy and uh, knowledge and enlightenment also. Um, and... I can remember different times, like just 
maybe Sid wasn't around or something, but we would be chatting about things, personal things, and ask her, her a question. Because to me, she was like a, um, a mom, a, you know, a, an older, wiser friend, mentor. And she, as I say, she was so quiet. She didn't chatter along, all of that. You know, she would just make a cup of tea and be quietly there. But every once in a while, she would say something, <laughs> just like was Sid. It was so like common sense solid it's like oh uh i've been dealing with this issue for a couple of years and i'm you know something this and i'm all of that and she just say a couple of sentences it's like oh okay that's it uh, i've never met anyone like strong person um and and I, i've always felt that of course that she was the first one who sid worked with and taught you know what what had come through him but what I just realized the last few weeks we've been talking was that she was also, I guess, the first teacher. Um, because she was, in, in that quiet way, influencing all of those of us who came around in the early days was a huge influence. I know on all of us, you know, sort of ladies, as Sid always called us, um, am amazing woman. And I, I, uh, she never sort of got up on stage in a chair or in a, in a group and sat there beside Sid and spoke and, and talk. That wasn't her role, but there she was behind Sid, 100%, um, as I say, like his anchor, because the demands upon Sid in his time became greater and greater. And just like you said, you know, people and calls and then psychologists coming and traveling and uh, uh, and there she was, just the rock, you know, of, of sanity. And um, and when she had to, speaking to us, you know, giving us all maybe a bit of advice or uh, just communicating in some way, just talking, but with such um, a amazing compassion and, and not wisdom, I guess is the word, just as I say, one of the strongest and wisest women I've ever met in my life and really under under acknowledged in this whole movement was um, how, how uh, powerful she was and of course she left us much too soon and has not not been around for many years but amazing amazing woman David, Dave, thank you, Linda. Dave, David, do you have any thoughts before we switch gears? Is there anything that you feel you can add sort of historically or, or, or personally? Well, there's obviously, there's a lot that <laughs> could be unpacked, but there, with, you know, there's a time constraint and there's only so much you can say uh, in, in, a, in this hour format. But um, uh, well, we can, I, we can give you a few minutes, I think, David. <laughs> well, I, a lot of people do ask, are curious, you know, was this kind of a gradual, uh, mm -hmm. his, his enlightenment was in the gradual experience, or was it a lightning strike, or what, what was it? But basically, um, as I've said, I think it was, um, he wasn't really thinking much about spirituality in his early adult years, um, and then for whatever reason, he, he started his journey. And then, then there were those two particular events, the Cold Mountain event and then the Paul Free Island event, which um, set him on a whole different course, his life on a whole different course. And then after that, um, you know, I wouldn't say that he, um, I don't think he had any kind of insight anywhere, anywhere near that after that event, the right. second event. Uh, but of course, as he went through life, he, his, um, you know, his, he, he, he matured and changed his viewpoints in, in lots of different ways, just like anybody else. Um, and, 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 and the language that he used changed over time as well. Um, the early years, he used quite different language with um, spiritual language than he used later on, particularly towards the three P years. That well, that changed Sorry, David, that, that might be worth unpacking a little bit for people. Where, where did his early spiritual influences come from? Well, you know, um, different people have different viewpoints on this. But from my perspective, I think he was influenced primarily by, by, two, by, by 
two different um, writings. One was Buddhism, and the other was Christianity. Um, and you know, he, I can remember the house in the early days, you know, around the time of his second um, experience of being full of books, and th those included, you know, Christian Murdy, uh, Joseph Campbell, Carlos Castaneda, you know. Uh, but um, the two that I think. First, this, this is just me, but the two that I think influenced the most was Alan Watt, who was also British, and um, and um, Masters of the Far East. That collection, I think, also he was quite uh, it was quite endearing to him. But uh, Alan Watt, of course, was a, was a was a, a Christian pastor, Church of England pastor, who became very enamored with Buddhism and tried to, to find some middle ground, common ground between this these two uh, theological perspectives mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, in some ways dad was quite interested in that trying that middle ground as well in the early days so he used very different language he used the word God a lot he used you know, energy he used the word soul a lot yeah and and that language kind of uh, fell away as as the years progressed in a different vernacular developed um, Let's, let's after the after the psychologist that became more involved. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and we talked about this a little bit how he used the vernacular, like whatever whatever he was trying to express, he was using the language that he was familiar with at the time. Um, yeah. So he, what I'm hearing is that um, your father was not an un, an uneducated, you know, <laughs> grade nine educated welder. It sounds to me like he was on the forefront of you know, the spiritual or enlightenment or consciousness movement of the late 60s and 70s. Does that, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, he was, he, he, he was, he, he sometimes made, made the flippant comment. So I've, I've read more, or I've written more books than I've read. But I think that was a really flippant comment, actually. He might've been said, I've read more books worth reading. You know, I, I mean, I've written more books worth reading than I've read because he, there, he felt that a lot of the kind of new age writings weren't worth reading or were misleading people and actually could be quite damaging to people. Um, he read a lot when I met him, when I knew them. Yeah. Um, he read a lot. Mm -hmm. I think part of it was almost like confirming, uh, you know, and some of these books did that for him, like Krishnamurti, uh, who spoke a lot about Christ consciousness. And uh, I think he was um, almost like confirming his experience and, and how are, you know, these other like enlightened people, their experience and how are they uh, described? Are they as, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. If and I could interject. Carl Jung was another, another name that he read. Carl Jung was another person. He yeah. Liked. If I could hold on, Linda, hold on, Linda, Linda, just before you go, David, yeah. you made a comment. Um, that I kind of caught there that you said that he thought that some of the new age writings or the writings of the time could be dangerous for people. Yes. Can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, in particular, he was very, he had strong views about, um, uh, um, some of the psychological, um, writings of, of the time. And, and, um, he, he was not very, um, this, okay, we have to be a little careful about this because he talked a lot about the dangers of going back in the past. Right. Um, and one has to be a little careful because um, that could be misread as to exactly what he meant. Like he was well, not that, affecting Sigmund Freud, that's for yeah. sure. Uh, and Sigmund Freud's work he thought could be really damaging. To you. Sigmund Freud, of course, was very much concerned with taking people back in the past. Now, taking someone back in the past isn't necessarily a bad thing. But if they're taken back and left there, yes, that's a bad thing. What an could, could, could I tell a, a, yeah. as brief as I can my story here? Because when I met Sid, no. I had just come from um, a couple of months in um, uh, yeah. a mental hospital where I had the maximum amount of shock treatments um, uh, that you can have in British Columbia. And um, Sid was... Uh, looking for students and you know i came along and really quickly i don't know like days a couple of weeks or something and i had been depressed for years i had been on medication and finally my doctor sends me to a psychologist and 
then they send me to another therapist. I end up with a psychiatrist who's the top psychiatrist in British Columbia and runs this mental hospital. Um, and it's all about the past. And they're always digging, delving into, well, what horrible uh -oh. thing happened We've in lost my Linda. past? You know, am I there? You are back. Okay. Like what horrible thing was that? And all of this was years of them delving and and what they decided was uh, something had happened so traumatic that I would be depressed um, so for such a long time that it was something so traumatic that I had buried it and it was buried so deeply and of course I realized later that's nonsense but so I go through this thing I go to the hospital I come out I come home they tell me I will be on medication the rest of my life and um, I'm sent home with three or four different medications, um, uppers, downers, muscle relaxants, antidepressants, and that I will be back for shock treatments probably every six months a year for the foreseeable future. And for I'm, what, my mid-20s or something, this is really jerk news day. So I meet Sid, and within a couple of weeks, like his, the whole thing right from the beginning, I'm trying to tell him my story, and it's like the past is gone. This was his thing. And the problem he had with with these books, these kinds of um, consciousness raising groups that Bill and I were in because they were focused on the past and you know, getting rid of your anger, getting into, and that's what happened to me. They sort of got me in touch with you know, um, these negative feelings, but it's like, okay, this happened, that happened. But of course they didn't have the answer to like, how, okay, now I'm aware of this, but how do you get rid of it? But with Sid, it was like, past is gone, it's dead, doesn't matter, not important. Not only did he say that and teach it, but he just like act, lived it, acted it. And so re within like a couple of weeks, I knew, wow, did I ever get off track with that? And that was very powerful, I think, for him too, because he could see this work, huh? this work. Within a couple of weeks, it's I threw away all his medication, have not had maybe a, a painkiller since, since that time. Uh, it was a, a miracle. So, Michael, he, he, yes. my dad was very uh, commonly would say, used, used, he would say that the past is just a memory carried through time. He yes. would often yes. say, say those words, a memory carried through time. So his point was that there's nothing wrong with going to the past. There's nothing wrong with reminiscing or even vis revisiting um, uncomfortable uh, incidents or experiences. but you have to realize that it actually doesn't exist. It only exists in your own mind. If you, then it has no power over you. It has no, no control over you. So it's nothing wrong with going into the past if, if you can almost see the innocence of those memories. That they, and that's exactly what happened to him with his experience, was that he realized, in his case, he had this really kind of deep insecurity that it was, it was just all created. Yeah, it had, and then once it had no power over him, he was free. Right. And and so, so that's why I, I say you have to kind of put it into context when you talk about it. it. Doesn't mean that you should never go into the past. He's not saying that, but he's saying just let it go. You know, look at it like it's like it's like a movie or something. You go into the past, your own life, and you look at it like it was a movie scene. It's not real. It's just. Um, Bill said, it's just a thought, so yeah. you can just drop it. It's just a thought, like, just yeah. drop it. <laughs> What's, um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move us along here. I'm just getting cognizant into the time. And, and um, just for those of you that are out there, um, I have had the good fortune of speaking to David and, and, and Linda about a lot of this stuff already. And I'm hoping we'll get more webinars out of them because um, they both know Sydney's work really, really well. And we're not, we're not delving into, into any serious questions, I don't think, on this call. Um, but but they, they have the answers to those as well. So um, there was a really quick question. Um, was he, so this is a live question. Has, was he, what was he studying or was he studying anything before his enlightenment experiences? Um, yes, the, the, the readings that I, I just described, he was, okay, he was reading all of those. So there was, you know, maybe up to a dozen different uh, writers that I can think of. 
Okay. I just finished. wanted to clarify that really Ernest, quickly. Ernest Holmes was another one. Right, right, right. Um, is, is, sorry, David, is, is there truth to the story that he found that book at the local dump? Yes, I saw well, I saw. found it at a recycling found... depot. Excuse me, yeah, at a recycling depot. All right, yeah. so, so let's, okay. We're going to, I said we were going to switch. Sites, I think it's both, yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. David. I cut you, I cut you off there. Um, We've got about 15 or so minutes officially. Um, and I have a, I got a really good question. Um, science, in, it, science in mind, it's called, sorry, science in mind. That's right. Yeah, yeah, it's a big beast. It was of his Bible. Thing. He said it was his Bible. Yeah. So this is a question that I got from someone recently, and uh, I think it bears, it's a good question. I think it fits here. Um, was Sid's teaching, and I'm just going to read it verbatim, was Sid's teaching aimed at improving others' psychological well-being or at helping others attain enlightenment? No, he wasn't, he wasn't interested in others attaining enlightenment, per se. Uh, he was interested in being able to function in a more healthy manner, to have, uh, uh, be able to live day to day without being burdened with um, the anxieties and the, um, the fears and the, um, the dark, dark feelings that they were experiencing. Um, so he, so he, so there was value to him in day-to-day -day life then in, in the world of form for lack of a better word. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's... He, he wanted people to have basically well-being is what he wanted. He wanted them to be able to live without the burden of um, all these very negative um, feelings. Brilliant stuff. There's so much. Um, thanks for taking that one, David. Um, what, uh, so this is, this is one that's probably on everyone's mind. Um, does the 3P, 3P teaching as it stands today resemble what his dad discovered? Um, yes and no, mostly no. But uh, it, I agree. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, at some point um, in the mid, kind of mid to late 1970s, there was a group of psychologists who, who came to visit him. A chief among them was was Roger Mills, who is a dear, is a dear family friend of ours. And um, he basically wanted to find a way, and Roger was a very accomplished person intellectually. He had studied at Princeton and Michigan and spoke fluent Mandarin, and he was uh, really a, a man of letters in many ways, I would say. But he was very interested in taking dad's message and knowledge uh, into the classroom um, and into his profession and, and be presenting it in a way that might be more acceptable to those who weren't necessarily on a, on a, on a spiritual mission. And um, so Roger came up with a concept um, with innate health. And so 3P, in my opinion, is if you draw a pyramid, the base of that pyramid is innate health. That's basically um, what 3P is all about. It's about trying to achieve innate health. Dad never used innate, innate, the term innate health, to my knowledge. I never heard him use that term. So this was all created by um, the psychologist. And um, so it, it's a completely different lexicon language, different vocabulary that, that, that's used that he didn't use to a large extent. Yeah. Would you one, agree of the things, one of the things you talked about um, when, when, you know, and I guess I was there from day one of his, te his what you might call his teaching work was energy. And he said frequently that his experience when he had it was that, you know, like all enlightened people, uh, what he experienced was God. Uh, and I was at a very, very early talk um, by Eckhart Tolle, who is, I read was now considered the top, you know, spiritual teacher on the planet and on the globe with, I don't know, 100 million or 18 million followers. But Eckhart said something really interesting. He said, you can't talk about God because 
um, all of us, like I was, I spent, you know, 12 years in Catholic convent school. So I have my idea, you know, I was taught about God as the supreme being and he knows all, sees all and, you know, judges, so on. And everyone has their um, different idea of what God is. So when you say God, all of those things from, you know, if there's 30 people in the room, they all have this different experience. Or some people have, have no religious background. They have no belief system, nothing. So Eckhart said, what, what he, he talks about is presence, which is the same thing. Well, that's what Sid did. Uh, because really early on, he, you know, he would talk about his experience was experiencing God or, you know, but he's, what he said was his experience was that the definition of God was, it is the energy of all things. And this was his experience. He experienced that he was part of this. We're all part of this, the energy of all things. And that was his definition. If someone asked, what about God or something? It's the energy of all things. And so energy. Or universal energy. Yeah. And well. yes. And he used that term. But he talked, he used that word energy a huge amount. And that there was negative energy. And the things you just talked about, Dave, within your, you know, people's lives, daily lives, there's negative energy, positive energy. If you ha and he talked about levels of co consciousness. Mm -hmm. So some people come in and they sit down and listen to Sid and they get up and walk out halfway through, you know, what's this weirdo talking about? And someone else, um, you know, like Sherry sits there and walks out and says, oh, my whole life has changed. So what's the difference? Well, it's levels of consciousness. Um, and if you have a very low level of consciousness, you're into negativity. So what would that be? It would be all the negative emotions and anger and, you know, those things um, and positive energy. So he was always explaining energy and even he would be personal, like on a certain day, he might say, gee, you're really, you know, you're really into the, you know, the negative energy today aren't you you know you come in along and you start complaining to them or you come and you're you know just glowing and having a wonderful day and it's like wow you know he, and so th these were the types of things that that he talked about in the, the early days and he talked did talk about god and christ consciousness and i think when psychologists came along then it, you know he could see well this isn't a message i can take out to the world using words like Christ, God, and so on. Um, and so he, he changed, I think not so much as teaching, but how, you know, the words he used to express this so that it was acceptable. More I, acceptable. Think, I think Michael, that uh, to the, in, in the minds of some people in, in, in the more intellectual mind, the, the psychologist, what dad was speaking about seemed a bit esoteric or, mystical and i think the idea was that how could they present this in a more applied way like the difference between basic science and applied science how do you take this and you create a framework whereby um it's maybe more palatable to uh people who are not necessarily so inclined towards an esoteric perspective so, uh, so, at, at the same time, not losing the value of it, you know. So who yeah. who who came up who um who came up with the three principles? Well, I always tell a story because I I, <laughs> I don't think it was just one person. No, no, because I was kind of involved with what had happened. Um, and should I tell that story? Which story is that? I don't well, know. Well, that he was um. <laughs> He was um, in, there was a huge group uh, who were followers of um, uh, Joel Goldsmith of The Infinite Way. And he was around 50, 60, oh, right. 60 yeah, yeah. wrote 30, 40 books and had a huge following, maybe a hundred, a couple of hundred people in Victoria, BC. And when Sid first went to speak there uh, and he went, you know, more and more often to Victoria, uh, those students came. And very many of them, you know, heard Sid and it's like, wow, yes, you know, and believed in him. Um, and so he was invited there to speak in front of these hundred of people. But the people running the group sort of said, well, no, no, we're an infinite way group, you know, 
um, anyone who, and, and this is an open teaching, anyone who wants to hear Sidney Banks can go hear him, but we can't have him come and, you know, do a different teaching at, at our talk. So this went back and forth. So he had a meeting, uh, asked if he could meet up with the woman heading this group, and I had met her, so I picked her up at the ferry and brought her over to Sid's, and I was sitting there um, with the two of them, and they were discussing this, how can this work that Sid can speak with the following from the infinite way. And she said, well, she said, my understanding, the problem that I've heard about your teaching is people just can hear something or they see something or, um, and there's no structure. And my feeling says, yeah, of course. Yeah, great. Isn't that, that's what's so wonderful about it. But it's like, you need some structure. Uh, you need principles. The infinite way has principles. And the conversation went on like this. And of course, if you read a, open up a Joel Goldsmith book on every page, he talks about the principles of life. Mind you, his principles weren't mind consciousness and thought. But, um, and Sid is listening to this and it's like, okay, um, he talks about mind, he talks about consciousness, he talks about thought. Um, so a few days later, he has, he's talking about in writing about it in the form of principles. Okay, you want me to get a little more structured? Is this what it's going to take? You know, like changing terminology and not saying Christ consciousness. Um, if this is what it takes to help, you know, 10,000 people instead of eight, then I'll do this. David, I, I notice you nodding away there. Do you have something to add to that? Um, I just think there's a really important point here, which is that Dad was constantly reminding people to look for the feeling. It wasn't in the word that the secret was found. It was in the feeling. And um, he would often say, look beyond the words and look for the feeling. Yeah. And anybody who met him personally would certainly was impacted by that that feeling now in terms of 3p it's it's the value of it it, it only has value when that feeling is there if the feeling is absent in any kind of teaching uh, then all you have is a structure and a framework with words and strategies that's intellectual yeah. well, and, and we yeah then it becomes an intellectual exercise um and it so it's very important the feeling um, is there in the room because otherwise the value is significantly reduced. Let's put it that way. People used to ask like, uh, well, what did he say? You know, he gave a talk. Oh, well, what did he say or something? And you couldn't really ever repeat right. it because he was there coming out of, and when he said feeling, feeling, and I think a lot of people, uh, including myself, you know, in the beginning, we all got confused about that because we thought, oh, the feeling, we want to have this wonderful, it's like, no, no, um, it's not just that you walk around in bliss all the time. Um, what it is, is it's, oh, what he was teaching us, it's not intellectual. This isn't something you learn, you know, you learn about the principles or how life works and you go out and you're okay. That's not it. You have to experience it. You have to have this feeling. You have to feel this. Um, and, and when he spoke, you could not go out afterwards and say, well, okay, well, here's what, what he said, because it was coming so just through, and he always said this, this isn't from his mind, and he's got this teaching, and he's teaching from his mind. He's sitting there talking in, in our small group or whatever, and it's, he, he would say it was coming through him. Yeah. It's coming through him. It's this feeling, and so you couldn't say, because it was never the same, never ever the same. Yeah, I think it's important to point out there, Linda, that that's right. He never he never rehearsed or practiced anything he said. He never worked from notes or anything like that. In fact, he used to say until he actually sat down in the chair, he didn't know what he was going to say. You know, uh, so and he, and he often said that when we were hearing, because he would say every once in a while yeah. something so new, different, and spellbinding from what he said had been saying and was and we're all sort of blown our mind where did that come from and he always said that we were hearing that for the first time and so was he that he would just open himself up to the energy of the universe like you say no notes no idea what he's gonna he'd just sit down and he'd do this and he called it going inside he would just center himself 
uh, open his eyes, sit up, look around, and start to speak. And pretty soon, this is just coming through him. And he said, uh, not, not all the time, but occasionally, as he's talking, some new and significant, inspirational, amazing thing comes through. And he'd say afterwards, wow, like that was he was just learning that that was the first time he'd ever heard it just like we were hearing it for the first time so, so it was he, very unstructured his, his approach totally, was extremely totally unstructured, unstructured. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's it's just after three i've got um i'm trying to listen to it, but i'm getting a few notifications of some questions can we take a couple of quick questions david okay go ahead michael i'll do my best Okay, so so these are, I don't think they'll be too challenging. Um, one of them is, um, is, is there someone that you know of in the community now that best exemplifies the teachings of your father? Well, and firstly, he, I'd say, he, he, I, I, I'm hesitant to create any kind of equivalence because I think he was really unique in, in, mm -hmm. in, in his own person, in, in his own approach. Um, I don't think there there wasn't anyone like him or is anyone like him. Um, but there maybe are people who he would have some fundamental agreement with. Um, and um, Eckhart Tolle, who Linda mentioned, might be one of those people. Um, but, um, you know, he... Um, he also lives here. Sid lived up the road there and yeah. Eckhart up the road there. <laughs> I lived in the middle of them. So, one thing is he could, he could tell straight away like in an instant, whether someone had actually uh, knew what they were talking about or was had, was speaking from the right place, he could tell right away. Yeah. There was there was no uh, duping him on that point. Yeah. <laughs> I, I spoke to him. I spoke to him once about yeah. Eckhart Tolle, and um, because uh, it was a student of Sid's, a, a follower who lived in Victoria, who was friends with Eckhart. Or I don't know how this happened, but the first talk that Eckhart ever gave was in Victoria and there were about 10, 12 people there. I can't believe I was there. It was his first talk. This is about 10 or 12 people. And I said to, I talked with Sid about it later and um, I said, you know, it's amazing to me is that he's talking and so similar to what Sid was saying in the beginning that the two of them, they were almost like saying the same thing, which I thought, you know, considering that, because the uh, source is the same, that's why. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, yeah. well, you know, what uh, an incredible mm. thing. And that's true. That's where, uh, you know, mm. Sid, his um, teaching never became worldwide. Uh, but that, what I attribute that to is because he was 20, 30 years earlier where people weren't just, and maybe Sid was one of the people who prepared the way. So when Eckhart came out and is telling this, then he's on Oprah and he's known worldwide. But Sid, it's, it was the same, coming from the same place, the same teaching. Mm -hmm. And I have personal experience of that. And Sid, Sidney Banks was there. Mm -hmm. So we're getting, we're getting close. I've got one more, um, David, and, uh, and I've just lost it. So give me a second to get it back. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I found it again. It's not up there in the universe somewhere, Michael. That's right. It, it, like, fortunately, it came back pretty quickly. Um, so I, I want to reiterate again that, um, that I've spoken to Dave and Linda both in greater depth about concepts, um, you know, free will and choice and things like that. And David, they're both very, very knowledgeable on that. And I know that we haven't touched on, on that kind of depth because we just don't have the time. So the hope with this first... I'm saying first webinar, <laughs> we'll see what happens. It was to serve as an introduction to Dave and, mm -hmm. uh, and to, and excuse me, and, and also to Linda. Um, so, so the, and I, I think I'm going to ask one more question here and that was, um, and I've lost it again. That's so funny. Let's ask Amir if he's got a question while I bring that last one back. Yeah. Um, wow, this has been incredible. I'm just listen, watching the. Uh, okay, okay, I got it again. Okay, well, I, I do have a quick question. Amir should allow me to get one question. In. Thank you, guys. Um, Go ahead. Uh, what are you having for lunch? No, that's not my question. Okay, so that's profound. <laughs> my question um, to 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 both Dave and Linda, whichever one you guys, um, if it was up to you guys 
today, what do you think would be the most valuable direction? The, I don't want to even say the principles because it sounds like that's not what your father would have said. The direction of this understanding would be the most valuable for people. There's a lot, there's so many people that are trying to find um, some sort of meaning behind, you know, what we call the principles now, but what would you guys consider the direction people should be looking into from your, from what you guys have seen? Agreed. I'll, if I could speak, um, having come th through the whole, you know, the teachings from the very beginning to today, I would say, um, I know after in my first two books, uh, the third one, I talk about my experience with Sid, but the first two were actually, um, the first writings when, when Sid had his experience, he began to write. And when we did that Island of knowledge together, what he did was handed me these yellow, um, sheets um handwritten so as things came to him right after his experience he began to write them and he gave them to me and those are teachings that appeared in those first two books the other thing is in the last two three years where these books came out again uh and i had a huge collection of sid's early tapes and i can't believe i did this i gave them away at some point and the woman i gave them to said oh I know something is like but the um, early tapes surfaced, many, many early tapes. And I would say uh, those early tapes where he would just sit there and go into this profound space. Um, and, and as I said, it's like you were, you knew you were in church or something amazing was happening. Um, and it was, I think, a more simple uh, teaching minus the, the structure just coming out of that, um, you know, that font of wisdom that he had tapped into um and any any way to access those and he said he said um himself that the energy that came with that you know and after years years it it, it began to fade but in the beginning it was just so powerful so i would think um those early tapes for sure and sid's uh writings and and books and yeah. that's course personally just my take on it but Dave uh, I, I would just add, add to that that I think in many ways his teachings are timeless so it's not like they're you know have to do with a particular generation or particular period of time or anything like that I think that his teachings are universal and timeless and so um, they will always be there for for um, to, to, to help people and um, Hopefully, they have helped a lot of people and hopefully will continue to help a lot of people. And um, I, I, don't, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag here, Linda, but Linda, Linda's recently come ac across oh. some. Oh. <laughs> I'm not going to say much about it, but, but you know, there, may be, there may be more to come. Just put it that way. Oh, man. Oh, man. Wait, what did we just, okay, should we just leave that alone? Or that just, just, yeah, leave that, that alone, leave that alone, leave that alone. Okay. This is big. It's leave big. it alone, yeah, leave it alone. So let, let me, let, last question, David. Um, what do you it's see? It's not the end of the road, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah well said. Yeah. What, um, if you see yourself as having a role in the contemporary world of 3P or a, a continuing what your father started, what is it? Do you see yourself having a role there? Would you like to have a role? I don't know. I, 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 there's a lot of there's a lot of value in in three P. I I think, and I, I but it all as I say, it all comes down to um, how it's practiced and 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 if that feeling is there or not. That's what it comes down to. So, uh, Dave, a lot a lot of people will will be helped by it. I'm sure. Dave, if I could say something, Dave is the most modest a person. <laughs> Dave Banks, well, like your father, that. he must write. This fellow sends me emails that yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. brings tears to my. He's like a cross between, and I am. I ha, I'm a course, a Shakespeare course short of an honors degree in English lit. Right, this is what I did after I knew <laughs> it. Okay. So I, I've got ten thousand books here. Right, this guy writes like a cross between Wordsworth um carl Jung and james joyce you know oh, he, he must write Thank you so much. he must write <laughs> i don't think he's deserving but 
Yeah. I will, I will, I will quickly corroborate that David is one of the most modest and humble people that I have met, and exactly. his intelligence. Um, there's a well, lot to learn from sounds, David. Sounds like I'm not being humble, so I, I, I won't comment. Well, I'll say where you are, David. <laughs> do, you ever, um, do you? Um, we, I know we touched on this. Do you ever see yourself teaching? Whatever that means to you. He is teaching. He just well, doesn't. I've been a teacher for a long time, um, uh, yeah, a few point. decades, a couple of decades at least. Yeah. So, I mean, that's my profession actually. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was a graduate student in Montreal then in, in, in Cambridge, England, and that's right. where I trained as a teacher. So, um, yeah, it's, it is kind of, it is kind of my profession actually, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, does that mean you might consider carrying on some of the teachings of your dad's uh well i think you know i hope i, I try to live it as much as i can and um he's doing it and that's yeah. really, so, he's doing yeah. it that's really actually an important thing and, and is maybe where we can wrap up um can you say if, a little bit about your father's idea of bringing the principles into daily life or excuse me bringing his enlightenment experience into daily life like how do you, well, how do you think, best share, I guess, is the question. I think, Michael, that, that um, he would say, you know, I, again, I'm really reluctant to try to, you know, be his spokesperson. But I, yeah. I, would, I think what he would say to that is that don't, don't make too big a deal about it. Like, don't overthink it. And uh, it's actually easier than you think. Mm. And just try to live it. And mm. when you live it and you share it, it will grow, you know, like a like the seed will grow into a plant. So, um, and if you don't, you will lose it. It will go away. So. Hold on, David, um, can, you, can you come back to that? You, you'll lose what? what? Well, whatever feeling you had, you will lose it if you, don't, if you don't live it and you don't share it, those two things. Right. Yeah. I think that is a beautiful place yeah. to end our call. Um, Amir, would you agree? Um, no, I'm keeping Dave for well, yeah. Dave and Linda for another two hours. Uh, so yeah. I'm sorry. You, you can go, Mike. You can go, Michael. No sweat. No, I, I listen. This is this is. It's it's better than I thought it was going to be. I already knew. I already had like a an idea behind this. But you guys are absolutely incredible. And um, yes, this is this is a, a perfect time to end it. And uh, everyone's just just so grateful for you guys. I'm I'm listening, and everyone's just saying how how amazing this was. I have a final question. Uh, sure. Linda and Dave, would you guys be willing to do another call? Possibly. Okay. Um, okay, if Dave goes for it, I'm in. <laughs> All right. We got we got a consensus. Got Fair it. enough. We got it. We got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, it's it's really important to me that um my father's legacy um you know be passed along to as many people as, as possible and 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 that his life be celebrated and his work be celebrated because it, he was a really exceptional person uh that the kind of person that doesn't come along very often mm -hmm. and um i think it's it's you know incumbent upon me to uh, make sure that his legacy lives on as much as possible. Yeah. I agree. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. And Dave, you are, are so, your dad, I have to say this, he would be just so, so proud of you because there you are speaking the way uh, you are. You know, um, my dad, my dad had a very, very, very dry sense of humor and a tremendous sense of humor. Anybody who knew him would agree with this. And one of the comments he used to make when someone made a co something he would say when someone made a comment like that was, I don't know who should be more insulted. So uh, <laughs> when you say you're a lot like your dad, he would say, I don't know who should be more insulted. <laughs> so <laughs> that was, well, I mean, I, that. I'm very sure he would say something like that. If he could... <laughs> See you sitting here today and, and yeah. listening to, to this he would yeah. it would i'm sure his heart would swell david yeah. i mean i knew your dad intimately for many many years mm -hmm. and um of course a kid always knows their parent from a 
and vice yeah. versa from a different point of view, but he would be, so, so, and I, I am so proud of the wonderful person I, you know, that little kid I met, the little eight or 10 year old has developed into this uh, wise person. Just, he yeah. would, he would just um, would make his day as he might say, huh? He'd, yeah. he'd have some, some funny little humor Scottish thing to say, I'm sure, but yeah. yeah. So I just, I just saw a question pop up that said, so what are they having for lunch? <laughs> I saw that. Of course, it's, yeah. uh, leave it to him to, to, to leave yeah, it up. Totally. <laughs> yeah. We're so, having probably uh, like greens. Uh, oh, this is greens <laughs> time on Salt Spring Island. All we've been eating for we two weeks now is greens, a lot of spinach, but I have to run out there and pick it. And uh, what else? Um, greens a lot of kale and radishes we've been having radishes yes. every day with our we love radishes I'm coming for the pie you can keep the radishes. And pie and we're having <laughs> this is spring rhubarb pie we have a crop of rhubarb oh, it's been the the weather's so amazing we have the best crop of rhubarb my husband built <laughs> his favorite thing in the world not mine needs to a phenomenal gardener for those of you who don't know he's an amazing gardener yeah david while you're here any last thoughts for us I don't think so, Michael. I just hope, I hope this was time well spent. I hope that people were able to get something out of it, learn something that they didn't know before. Um, and yeah, I just want to thank everybody for, for, um, for joining us. It's, it's, it's always nice to have um, friends to sit around and have a chat with. Hopefully they weren't disappointed. We'll see. I, I you know, was, it's, it's so amazing. Better. I think it's so amazing that so many people are open to hearing this. Okay, well, here's another alternate view, perhaps, of, of 3P World. And I have to say, Michael, thank you uh, for uh, I'm just so amazed at how totally, absolutely open, no matter what we say, you're, you're never so, like, attached to one viewpoint or other. You're just open, you know, taking it in. And, and you and Amir making uh, it possible for this to happen today for, for Dave and I and for so many people is just that that's um uh, i think you've taken 3p world off in a whole different direction <laughs> thank you so much that's very very kind i i have to say that over the time that we've spent together leading up to this i have learned a ton <laughs> and, I, and i look and i look forward actually um to getting into hopefully some of the more uh some of the more philosophical questions around your father's teachings maybe on another call yeah, that's what I was, I was thinking as well. I think this is such a cool and groundbreaking history, like how it's, how we got into the history of it and then kind of get a, the background. I, I will leave it with one last thing with both Linda and Dave. The biggest thing I left with is you guys' compassion and your love. I mean, your love for Sidney Banks, your love for what he's done. And uh, if I leave on this call, I just have a newfound, not that I didn't have a newfound uh, like respect for your father and what he's done for so many of us, but a deeper profound love for, for a man that I've never met just, just through you guys. So really, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I, I feel, I feel hundred percent the same way, Amir. Yeah. That's, that's a compliment, Amir. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, he, he, I'm sure my dad would be um, very chuffed to use the British term. Very <laughs> chuffed that, you, that you, you said those kind words about him. I almost feel like he's with us, and he is with us. He's with us, yeah. and yeah. Well, Amir, you, you're at the controls, so when it's time to shut her down, it's time to shut her down. Yes, and on that note, thank you for everyone that joined us. We ended up having 181 people on this call. Uh, no, we, and, had uh, for, we, had, we had 229. That's people have been dropping. Oh, out. wow. Yeah, that's right. People had to leave. Yeah. Everyone, thank you so much. Dave, Linda, from the bottom of my heart. Michael. Uh, everybody that that got this together, put this together, and I, I hope this is not the end of this conversation. I really think that we're onto something with this, and uh, and we'll hopefully see you guys soon. Please comment uh, in our group. Please um, let me know your thoughts, or in Michael's group as well. We'll put a link to that as well, and um, and we'll see you guys all soon. Have a wonderful day, and this will be this will be. Okay, Mary. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye bye. Take care, good you guys. Linda, good to see you again. See you soon. Bye Thank guys. You. Bye. bye. Bye-bye.